empires rose and fell, gender roles inverted. Technology had become indistinguishable from magic, but one thing has remained constant over 4,000 years, a hatred of the Jews, previously known as Hebrews or Israelites. This hatred has persisted over four millennia in every corner of the globe, involved every culture, every society, every ethnic group, every period in history. What gives? Why are the Jews so hated universally without a single exception? What's wrong with them? Or maybe what's wrong with the people who hate them? This is what we, what I will attempt to discover in this video, will set out to do, to review the arguments of anti-Semites as open-mindedly and as objectively as I can in view of the fact that I'm a Jew, but I'm also a professor of psychology <laughs> and the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. So I'll do my best. And I will analyze these arguments one by one, embed them in a historical context and see whether some of them may have merit or none of them. This is the, vo this is the, to the voyage that I'm inviting you to join. Let us start with a quotation, something written by Ignazio Silone. Only loss is universal, and true cosmopolitanism in this world must be based on suffering. Ignacio Silone. When we come across rabid anti-Semitism, coupled with inane and outlandish conspiracy theories of, I don't know, world dominion and the like, it's easy to counter and dispel. These are not cases. Wackos. And so it's easy to mock and ridicule them and, and you know, ostracize them and shun them and so on. But what do you do with a more reasoned, subtle, and stealthy variety of anti Semitism, Jew hatred, the kind that is pernicious, ubiquitous, all pervasive, and often masquerades? is something else. No smoke without fire, say people. There must be something to it. It can't be that a group of people has been universally hated everywhere, at any time, at all times. They must have been doing something wrong, or maybe something is wrong with them. So in this simulated dialogue between an anti-Semite and myself, I try to deconstruct a mild anti-Semitic text. I myself wrote both parts of the dialogue. I myself composed the anti-Semitic text. It is not an easy task, considering my ancestry, I'm a Jew as I mentioned, and my citizenship, I'm an Israeli. But to penetrate the pertinent layers historical, psychological, semantic, sem semiotic, I had to enter the skin, put myself in the shoes of a rational, classic anti-Semite to grasp what makes such a person tick and click and to think and reason like an anti-Semite. I dedicated the last few months to plowing through reams of anti-Semitic tracts and texts, steeped in more or less nauseating verbal insanity and sheer paranoia, I emerged to compose the following. But I must admit that I've come across texts that appear to be academic and scholarly, but it was only a veneer. Underneath it all, there was seething, raging, unrequited hatred and loathing for the Jews, 
and everything Jewish. Such psychology, or shall I say psychopathology, is not easy to explain because we find a lot of it in places or countries where Jews have never lived or where there is a very tiny, minuscule Jewish presence. So it doesn't seem the Jews are like allergens. They provoke an allergy. Their presence is not required for anti-Semitism to erupt and flourish. So it's not that. It's not the friction between Jews and Gentiles, non-Jews. It's something completely different. Let us endeavor to find out what by talking to an anti-Semite. The anti-Semite says, the rising tide of anti-Semitism the world over is universally decried. The proponents of anti-Semitism are cast as ignorant, prejudiced, lawless, crazy, or atavistic. Their arguments are dismissed offhandedly, complains the anti-Semite. But it takes one Jew to really know another. Conditioned by millennia of persecution, Jews are paranoid, defensive, and obsessively secretive. It is impossible for a Gentile, whom they hold to be inferior and reflexively hostile, it's impossible for a Gentile to really penetrate the Jews' councils. So, the anti-Semite says, allow me to examine anti-Semitic arguments more closely and in an unbiased manner. Argument number one, being Jewish is a racial distinction, not only a religious one. And here I interrupted my anti-Semite interlocutor with a response. But before we revert to my response, let us hear what he has to say. If race, he said, is defined in terms of genetic purity, then Jews are as much a race as the, as the remotest and most isolated of the tribes of the Amazon. Genetic studies reveal that Jews throughout the world, largely due to centuries of inbreeding, share the same genetic makeup. Hereditary diseases, which afflict only the Jews, attest to the veracity of this discovery. Judaism, says the anti-Semite, is founded on shared biology as much as on shared history and customs. As a religion, Judaism proscribes a conjugal union with non-Jews. Jews are not even allowed to partake in the food and wine of Gentiles and have kept their distance from the communities which they inhabited, maintaining tenaciously throughout countless generations their language, habits, creed, dress, and national ethos. Only Jews become automatic citizens of Israel, for example, the infamous law of return. I signaled to the anti-Semite that I would like to respond, and he, in a most civil manner, awaited my retort. And here is what I had to say. Race has been invariably used as an argument against the Jews. It is ironic that racial purists have always been the most fervent anti-Semites. Jews are not so much a race as a community united in age-old traditions and beliefs, lore and myths, history and language. Anyone can become a Jew by following a set of clear, though admittedly demanding, rules. There is absolutely no biological test or restriction on joining the collective that is known as the Jewish people or the religion that is Judaism. It is true that some Jews are differentiated from their Gentile environments. But this distinction has largely been imposed on Jews by countless generations of hostile hosts, neighbors, pogroms, and most lately the Holocaust. The Yellow Star of David was only the latest in a series of measures to isolate the Jews, to clearly mark the Jews, to restrict their economic and intellectual activities in ghettos, an Italian invention, and to limit their social interactions. The only way to survive was to stick together. 
Can you blame the Jews for responding to what you, anti-Semites, have so enthusiastically instigated and imposed on them? One last comment. A Jew is anyone whose mother is a Jew. In this sense, Judaism is matrilineal and indeed genetically conveyed. But this has nothing to do with race. This has to do with making sure <laughs> that a Jew was born to a Jewish parent and a mother is the safest bet in this sense. As I said, anyone can become a Jew at any time, regardless of skin color, previous religion, circumstances, personal biography, and what have you. Judaism is an affiliation, an allegiance, a club which you can easily join. The anti-Semite continued. Argument number two, he said, the Jews regard themselves as chosen, superior, or pure. Vehement protestations to the contrary notwithstanding, this is largely true. Your purported, purported and self-imputed ancestor, Ab Abraham, struck a Faustian deal with Yahweh or Jehovah, the monotheistic deity. It's a monotheistic deity that Abraham conjured. He, told, he sold Jehovah, his soul, in return for promises of wealth, might, and earthly possessions, most notably land, granted to him and to his lineage, now branded the chosen people. Orthodox Jews, said the anti-Semite, and secular Jews differ, of course, in the conception of this supremacy. The religious Jews attribute this chosenness or supremacy or uniqueness or privilege to divine will. Intellectual Jews attribute it to the outstanding achievements of Jewish scientists and scholars. And the modern Israeli is proud of his invincible army and thriving economy. But all Jews share a sense of privilege, narcissistic entitlement, uniqueness, which is grandiose, and a commensurate obligation to civilize their inferiors and to spread progress and enlightenment wherever they are. This is a pernicious rendition of the colonial white man's burden, and it is coupled with disdain and contempt for the lowly and the great unwashed, namely all the Gentiles, all the non-Jews. Taken aback a little, <laughs> I responded to the anti-Semite. There were precious few Jews among the great colonizers and ideologues of imperialism, the Israeli being the sole exception I can think of. Moreover, to compare the dissemination of knowledge and enlightenment to colonialism is a travesty. We, the Jews, we are proud of our accomplishments, of course. What's wrong with that? Show me one group of people, including anti-Semites, who are not. But there is an abyss between being justly proud of one's true accomplishments and feeling superior as a result. Listen, there are narcissists and megalomaniacs everywhere. And among the members of any human collective, Jews not accepted. Hitler and his Aryan superiority, Aryan superiority, is a good example. But Jews don't believe themselves to be chosen. They believe themselves to be employed. It's an obligation, not a privilege. Serving as beacon to other nations and the Gentiles is not a prerogative. It's not a perk. It's a serious punishment, as the history of the Jewish people has clearly evinced. Jews have been tasked by God, according to their own myth mythology. They've been tasked with a missionary vision or mission. They have to spread the word, spread the gospel in a way. That's why Christianity is very Jewish in this sense. And so is Islam. So it's not about being chosen. It's about being chosen to perform a task. The anti-Semite continued with his undeterred 
with his argument number three. Jews have divided loyalties. It is false to say that Jews are first and foremost Jews and then are they are the loyal citizens of their respective countries. Jews have unreservedly fought and sacrificed in the service of their homelands, often killing their co-religionists in the process, so admitted the anti-Semite. But it is true that Jews believe that what is good for the Jews is good for the country they reside in. By aligning the interest of their adopted habitat with their narrower and selfish agendas, Jews feel justified to promote their own interests to the exclusion of all else and all others. Moreover, says the anti-Semite, the rebirth of the Jewish state presented the Jews with countless ethical dilemmas which they typically resolve by adhering uncritically to Tel Aviv's official line. This often brought, brings the Jews into direct conflict with their governments and non-Jewish compatriots, and it enhances their reputation as a Trojan horse, a fifth column, untrustworthy and treacherous. Hence the Jewish propensity to infiltrate decision-making centers, such as politics and the media. The aim of the Jews is to minimize conflicts of interest by transforming their peculiar concerns and preferences into official, if not always consensual, policies. And this viral hijacking of the host country's agenda is particularly evident in the United States, where the interests of Jewry and of the only superpower have become inextricable. It is a fact, not a rant, that Jews are overrepresented in certain influential professions, in banking, in finance, in the media, in politics, in, in the film industry, in publishing, in science, in the humanities. This is partly the result of the emphasis that Jews place on education and social upward mobility, granted, but it is also due to the tendency of well-placed Jews to promote other Jews, their brethren, and to provide them with privileged access to opportunities, funding, and jobs over and above the opportuni opportunities they afford to Gentiles. This is discrimination, and perhaps a form of racism. I contemplated seriously this particular argument, and this is what I had to say. Most modern polities, most, most modern countries are multi-ethnic and multicultural, and anathema to anti-Semites, I know. <laughs> Every ethnic, religious, cultural, political, intellectual and economic or business group try to influence policy making by various means. It's legitimate, it's called lobbying. It's desirable even. Lobbying has been an integral and essential part of democracy since it was invented in, in Athens 2,500 years ago. The Jews and Israelis are no exception. They follow the rules of the game, they didn't invent them. Jews are indeed overrepresented in certain professions in the United States, but they are underrepresented in other equally important vocations. For example, among company chief executive officers, in politics, as diplomats, managers of higher education institutions, and senior bankers. Globally, Jews are severely underrepresented or non-existent virtually in most professions due to their demography. The Jewish population is aging fast, there are low birth rates, they're under the replacement rate, there are many unnatural deaths in wars and slaughters, so inevitably they are underrepresented in many, many fields. The anti Semite proceeded with argument number four Jews act as a cabal or a mafia. There is no organized, hierarchical, and centralized worldwide Jewish conspiracy, considered the anti Semite. Rather, the Jews act in a manner similar to a terrorist organization. They freelance and they self-assemble ad hoc in cross-border networks to tackle specific issues. 
Jewish organizations, many, many of them in cahoots with the Israeli government, they serve as an administrative backup. It's the same as some Islamic charities do for militant Islam. The Jews' ability and readiness to mobilize and to act in order to further their plans and agendas, this ability is a matter of record. And the source of the inordinate influence of their lobby organizations in Washington, for instance. It's not only ability, but willingness in mobilization. When two Jews meet, even randomly, and regardless of the disparities in their background, they immediately endeavor to see how they can further each other's interests, even and often at the expense of everyone else's interests. They are like Freemasonry. And still the Jewish diaspora, now two millennia old, is the first global phenomenon in world affairs. Bound by a common history, a common set of languages, a common ethos, a common memory, a common religion, common defenses and ubiquitous enemies, Jews learned to closely collaborate in networks in order to survive. This is the first case of instance of globalization. No wonder that all modern global networks, from Rothschild to Reuters to Facebook, were established by Jews. Jews also featured prominently in all the revolutionary movements of the past three centuries. Individual Jews, though rarely the Jewish community as a whole, but individual Jews seem to benefit no matter what. When Tsarist Russia collapsed, Jews occupied seven out of ten prominent positions in both the Kerensky government, and Kerensky was a Jew, and in the Lenin and early Stalin administrations. When the Soviet Union crumbled, Jews again benefited mightily. They formed the majority of oligarchs. Three quarters of the famous oligarchs, robber barons, that absconded with the bulk of the defunct empire's assets. These oligarchs were, you guessed it, Jews as well. No matter what happens to us Gentiles, you always end up on top. On top and wealthier than us. Wow, this sounded a lot like classic economic anti-Semitism. Not so sophisticated, I must say. So here was my succinct answer. Ignoring the purposefully inflammatory language for a minute, what group does not behave this way? Harvard alumni, the British Commonwealth, the European Union, the Irish or the Italians in the United States, political parties the world over, indeed the Islamic Ummah. As long as people cooperate legally and for legal ends, without breaching ethics and without breaking laws and without discriminating against deserving merit meritorious um, non-members, as long as everything is a meritocracy based on merit, what is wrong with it? The anti-Semite scoffed at my response and shook his head in disbelief. It seems that I haven't quite convinced him. He reverted, he proceeded actually, to argument number five. The Jews are planning to take over the world and establish a world government, headed, of course, by a Jew and staffed mostly by Jews. This is, he said, I personally don't believe in this. And this is the kind of nonsense that discredits a serious study of the Jews and their role in history, past and present. Endless lists of prominent people of Jewish descent are produced in support of, the, of, the, of this contention, of a looming uh, doomsday world government. Yet governments are not the mere sum of their constituent individuals, said my erudite, um, eloquent anti-Semite interlocutor. The dynamics of power, he continued, subsist on more than the religious affiliation of office holders, kingmakers, and string pullers. Granted, Jews are well introduced in the echelons of power almost everywhere, but this is still a far cry from a world government. 
Neither were Jews prominent in any of the recent moves, mostly by the Europeans, to strengthen the role of international law in attendant supranational organizations such as the European Union. What can I say? <laughs> I, what can I say? I said, I agree with you. I would only like to set the record straight by pointing out the fact that Jews are actually underrepresented in the echelons of power everywhere, including in the United States. Only in Israel, where they constitute an overwhelming majority, do Jews run things in a government. Having made this concession to the Jewish arguments, the anti-Semite proceeded to uh, an argument from psychology. Argument number six, Jews are selfish, narcissistic, haughty, double-faced dissemblers. Zionism is an extension of this pathological narcissism, is a colonial movement. Judaism is not missionary, said the anti-Semite. It is elitist. But Zionism has always regarded itself as both a national movement, 19th century national movement, and a colonial civilizing force. Nationalist narcissism transformed Zionism into a mission of acculturation, the white man's burden. The Jews will educate and elevate the poor Palestinians who are ignorant peasants. In Alt Neuland, translated to Hebrew as Tel Aviv, the feverish tome composed by Theodor Herzl, Judaism's improbable visionary and the father of Zionism. Herzl refers to the Arabs as pliant and compliant butlers, replete with gloves and tarbushes. <laughs> in the book, a German Jewish family prophetically lands in Jaffa, the only port in erstwhile Palestine. They are welcomed and escorted by Britishized Arab gentlemen's gentlemen who are only too happy to assist their future masters and colonizers to disembark. This is how the Jews of Europe regarded the Palestinians and frankly all Gentiles as inherently, innately inferior servants and butlers in the making. This age-old narcissistic defense, the Jewish superiority complex, was only exacerbated by the Holocaust. Nazism posed as a rebellion against the old ways, against the hegemonic culture, the upper classes, the established religions and the superpowers, the European order. The Nazis borrowed the Leninist vocabulary and assimilated it effectively. Hitler and the Nazis were an adolescent movement, a reaction to narcissistic injuries inflicted upon a narcissistic and rather psychopathic toddler nation state. Germany was established in 1870. Hitler himself was a malignant narcissist, as from a Jew correctly noted. The Jews constituted a perfect, easily identifiable embodiment of all that was wrong with Europe. They were an old nation, they were eerily disembodied without a territory, they were cosmopolitan, they were part of the establishment, they were decadent, they were hated on religious and socio-economic grounds, and they were different. They were narcissistic. They felt and acted as morally superior and intellectually superior. They were everywhere. They were defenseless. They were credulous. They were adaptable. And so they could be co-opted to collaborate in their own destruction. They were the perfect hated father figure. And Parisid was in fashion at the time. So I am not a neo-Nazi, continued my anti-Semitic interlocutor. I am not a neo-Nazi and I'm not a supporter of Hitler and I don't regard the Holocaust as a beneficial event. I, like everyone else, who is rational and who is learned, I recognize that the Holocaust has happened. I'm not a Holocaust denier. And I realize the Jews have been victimized. I tend to largely agree actually with another Jews book Goldhagen's Hitler's Willing Executioners. So don't daub me with a brush of neo-Nazism. Being an anti-Semite is a rational stance. 
based on long, a long study of history and culture and societies and periods and eras. Being an anti-Semite is an intellectual pursuit. It has nothing to do with the brutishness and brutality of the Nazi atrocities and horrors. Their attitude towards the Jews was not anti-Semitic, or at least not in the rigorous intellectual sense. It was, just, it was just plain envy and rage. The Holocaust was a massive trauma, not because of its dimensions, but because Germans, the epitome of Western civilization, have turned on the Jews, the self-proclaimed missionaries of Western civilization in the Levant and in Arabia. It was a betrayal that mattered to the Jews. They considered themselves Germans, rejected by East as colonial stooges and by West as agents of racial, racial contamination. The Jews resorted to a series of narcissistic responses, reified by the State of Israel. The long-term occupation of territories, metaphorical or physical, is a classic narcissistic behavior. It involves annexation, it involves apartheid, it involves, it involves atrocities against the civilian population. It involves everything the Nazis have done. The Six Days War was a war of self-defense, but the swift victory only exacerbated the grandiose fantasies of Messianic Jews. Mastery over the Palestinians became an important component of the psychological makeup and the identity of that nation, the nation of the Jews, especially the more right-wing and religious elements, but even, even others. It constituted a kind of what you call narcissistic supply. Phew, that was a long one. So I said, listen, happily, sooner or later, most anti-Semitic arguments descend into incoher incoherent diatribe. And this dialogue seems to be no exception, unfortunately. Zionism was not conceived out of time, out of its period. Zionism was born in an age of colonialism and nationalism. Kipling's white, white men's burden and Western Nazism were all the rage at the time. The Jews didn't invent any of this. Regrettably, Herzl did not transcend the political discourse of his period, but who can? Very few rare intellectuals do. Zionism is far more than Alt Neuland, Tel Aviv, a book that no one has read. <laughs> Herzl died in 1904, having actually been deposed by Zionists from Russia, who espoused the ideals of equality for all, Jews and non-Jews alike. The Holocaust was an enormous trauma and a clarion call. The Holocaust taught the Jews that they cannot trust anyone they cannot continue with their historically abnormal existence, and that all the formulas for accommodation and coexistence and assimilation, all these formulas failed. It was a wake-up call. There remained only one viable solution after the Holocaust, the Jewish state, as a member of the international community of nations. The Six Days War was indeed a classic example of preemptive self-defense. The Arabs, were about to attack the Jews. Its outcomes, however, deeply divide Jewish communities everywhere, especially in Israel. Many of us, myself included, believe that occupation corrupts. We reject the messianic and millennial delusions of some Jews as dangerous and nefarious and self-destructive. The recent events are just proof of that. Perhaps this is the most important thing to remember like every other group of human beings, though, we, though the Jews are molded by common experience, they are not monolithic. They are liberal Jews. They are orthodox Jews. They are narcissistic Jews. They are altruistic Jews. They are unscrupulous Jews. They are moral Jews. They are educated Jews and very stupid and ignorant Jews. They are criminals and law-abiding citizens. Jews, in other words, are like everybody else. Can we say the same about anti-Semites? I wonder, having been thus rebuffed, if not rebutted, my likable anti-Semite reverted to 
from anti-Semitism to anti-Zionism and anti-Israelism. The most recent incarnations of anti-Semitism in many cases, though not in all cases. He said, the state of Israel is likely to end as did the seven previous stabs at Jewish statehood in total annihilation. And for the same reasons, conflicts between secular and religious Jews and a racist colonialist pattern of deplorable behavior. The United Nations has noted this recidivist misconduct in numerous resolutions, even recently, and it justly compared Zionism to racism. I have to say, the, uh, look, I said, stop here. I have to set the record straight historically. History is about facts. Interpretations of history are not history historiography. Zionism is undoubtedly atypical, typical, normal, common 19th century national movement. It promotes the interests of an ethnically homogenous nation. But it is not and never has been a racist movement. Zionists of all stripes never believed in the inherent inferiority or malevolence or impurity of any group of people, however arbitrarily defined and capriciously delimited. They did not believe that their common origin or habitation afford them any innate advantages and privileges that they could exercise with impunity. This is a narrative imputed to Zionism, which has nothing to do with Zionism. Zionists actually were anti-religious, anti-clerical. They rejected Judaism. They rejected Judaism and its claims, even the claim of being chosen to perform a task as beacon to the nation, even this was rejected. Those, the, there were constant clashes, which are ongoing to this very day, between Orthodox Jews, which represent the traditional view of Judaism, conservative Judaism, and Zionists. The state of Israel is not exclusionary. There are, there are two million Israelis who are Arabs, Israeli citizens, both Christians and Muslims. It is true, though, that Jews have a special standing in Israel, special status. The law of return grants Jews immediate citizenship. Is this fair? Well, it's survival. Because of obvious, obvious conflicts of interest, Arabs cannot serve in the Israeli Defense Forces. We wouldn't expect them to kill their own brothers. Consequently, they don't enjoy the special benefits conferred on war veterans and ex-soldiers. These benefits are denied to Jews who did not serve in the army as well. Regrettably, it is also true that Arabs are discriminated against and they're hated by many Israelis. Israeli Arabs, Israeli citizens are second-class citizens. But this is never an official policy. This is grassroots. This is the kind of friction that gives rise to anti-Semites. These are the bitter fruits of the ongoing conflict. Budget priorities are also heavily skewed in favor of schools and infrastructure in Jewish municipalities. A lot remains to be done in this, in this sense. But let us not forget and let us not pretend. Israel is the state of the Jews. It's a Jewish state, period. There, it's not a modern nation state, which is open to all ethnicities and all cultures and all backgrounds and all origins. It is definitely a state dedicated to the survival and promotion of the Jewish people. Is it fair? The Jews congregated from all over the world and took over a piece of land which used to be inhabited by other people? There was a common practice in the 19th century. Jews started to come to Palestine around the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. Remember the Americans and the Native Americans, the Indians? So this was how it was done, ethnic cleansing and so on and so forth. Now, in the case of the Jews, even this is not true because the Jews purchased with money most of the land they live on. 
And the Arabs were not expelled in 1948. Well, some of them were, but the vast majority of Arabs who have left and became refugees have left because the Arab leadership told them to leave. I recommend that you read the books by Benny Morris, who is, if anything, not pro-Israeli. So the, the Palestinians on the territory of what is today the state of Israel left of their own accord because they believed the Jews were about to be exterminated by the invading Arab armies. Bad call. Wrong gamble. You have to pay a price. Every action has consequences. Every choice and decision has outcomes. The Arabs, the Palestinians, made theirs. So let us set the record straight as far as history. My anti-Semitic uh, guest not shook his head in disapproval. Zionism, he said, started off as a counter-revolution. It presented itself as an alternative to both orthodox religion and to assimilation in the age of European enlightenment. But it was soon hijacked by East European Jews who espoused a pernicious type of Stalinism and virulent anti-Arab racism. That's the truth. That's the history. Look, I said, East European Jews were no doubt more nationalistic and etatist than the Western, the West European visionaries who gave birth to Zionism, may I remind you. But again, East European Jews were not racist. Many of them were actually uh, kind of steeped in the equivalent of Marxism or communism. On the very contrary, the socialist roots of East European Jews called for a close collaboration and integration of all the ethnicities and nationalities in Israel-Palestine. Today, these East European Jews who became Zionists would have been rejected and labeled as anti-Zionists. The anti-Semite didn't let go of this argument. He insisted, insisted to pry and probe deeper, and I complied. He said, the status quo promulgated by Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, confined institutionalized religion to matters of civil law and to com communal, communal issues. All affairs of state became the exclusive domain of the secular leftist nomenclature and its attendant bureaucratic apparatus. But all this changed after the Six Days War in 1967, and even more so after the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Militant Messianic Jews with radical fundamentalist religious ideologies sought to eradicate the distinction between state and synagogue. They propounded a political agenda, thus invading the traditionally secular turf to the, greater to the great consternation of their compatriots. And this schism is unlikely to heal and it will be further exacerbated by the inevitable need to confront harsh demographic and geopolitical realities, don't you see? No matter how much occupied territory Israel gives up, no matter how many ersatz Jews Israel imports from Russia and Eastern Europe, the Palestinians are likely to become a majority within the next 30 to 50 years. Israel will sooner or later face the need to choose whether to institute a policy of strict and racist apartheid or to shrink into an indefensible ghetto, though majority Jewish enclave. The fanatics of your religious right are likely to enthusiastically opt for the first alternative, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, genocide maybe. All the rest of the Jews in Israel are bound to recoil and comply. Civil war will then become unavoidable, and with it the demise of yet another short-lived Jewish polity. I must say, some of this resonated with me. Some of it resonates with me. I, as I told you, I'm a left-wing uh, Israeli. Israel is indeed faced with the unpalatable choice and demographic realities that you describe can be either Jewish or democratic, but never both. But I wouldn't bet on a civil war and total annihilation just yet. 
There are numerous other political solutions, for instance, a confederacy of two national states, or one state with two nations. But I agree, this is a serious problem, further compounded by Palestinian demands for the right to return to their ancestral territories. But these territories are now firmly the Jewish state, even in its pre-1967 borders. If the Palestinians were to return to the lands they have absconded, the lands they have abandoned, in vast majority of cases voluntarily, if they were to return to these lands, this would automatically uh, negate, obviate and dismantle the state of Israel. No Israeli would accept this. With regards to the hijacking of the national agenda by right-wing religious fundamentalist Jewish militants, as the recent pullout from Gaza and some of the West Bank proves conclusively, Israel's alt Israelis ultimately are pragmatic, the pragmatists. The influence of messianic groups on Israeli decision-making is there, but I think it's blown out of proportion. These people uh, are vocal and sometimes violent, but when push comes to shove, usually Israel compromises and strikes a deal that is livable. The anti-Semite interjected, Israel could perhaps have survived had it not committed a second mortal sin by transforming itself into an outpost and beacon of Western um, neo-colonialism. First, Israel was a long arm of the British and the French in 1956, the Sinai War, and then, and now, it is an extension and long arm of the United States. As a representative of these oppressors and colonialists and imperialists, Israel was forced to resort to an official policy of unceasing war crimes and repeated grave violations of human and civil rights. Again, I had to contemplate this argument because on the face of it, it appears to be rational and judicious and well, well supported. And underneath it, underneath it, there, there is this tone of Jew hatred. Israel aligned itself with successive colonial powers in the region, true, but it did so because it felt it had no choice. Surrounded and outnumbered as it is by hostile, trigger-happy, murderous, heavily armed neighbors, all of them Jew haters, religiously even. Israel did miss, though, quite a few chances to make peace, however intermittent and hesitant, with its erstwhile enemies. It is equally true that it committed itself to a policy of settlements and oppression within the occupied territories, which inevitably gave rise to grave and repeated violations of international law. Overlording other people has a corrosive, corrupting influence, and the Israeli society is no exception. And is, yes, Israel does commit war crimes. I'm not denying this. And I'm, of course, not proud of it, to use another statement. To some extent, I don't feel this country is mine anymore. But I'm still a Jew. And one should not conflate Judaism and the Jewish people with Israel and its decisions and sometimes transgressions. The state of Israel is a manifestation of certain strands and trends within the Jewish people. The Jewish people has preceded the state of Israel by a few millennia and will survive, should the state of Israel cease to exist, will survive this new Holocaust, the same it did, the previous one. So, I agree with you regarding some of the behaviors of the state of Israel. I point out that some of it was motivated by a perception that there's no choice, no other choice, but I resent and reject an attempt to project this collective guilt, if you wish, uh, and create collective punishment, derive collective punishment for the totality of the Jewish people. 
my interlocutor paused and then said, the, the Arabs who first welcomed the Jewish settlers and the economic opportunities that they represented, these Arabs turned against the new immigrants when they learned of their agenda of occupation, displacement, and ethnic cleansing. Israel became a pivot of destabilization in the Middle East, embroiled in conflicts and wars too numerous to count. Unscrupulous and corrupt Arab rulers used the existence of Israel and the menace that it reified as a pretext to avoid democratization, transparency, and accountability. You know what's the joke, the cosmic joke on the Jewish people, said the anti-Semite? The joke is that nowhere are Jews less safe than in the state of Israel. And no other country in the world is endangering the safety of Jews and the live, lives of Jews and the livelihood of Jews more than the state of Israel. Jews everywhere are suffering and endangered because of the state of Israel. It's a total failure if this indeed were the main motivation for the establishment of a state of Israel, then it has failed miserably. I, I begged him to, to interject, and he um, assented graciously. I said, look, with the exception of the 1919 Faisal-Weizmann declaration, Arabs never really welcomed the Jews. Attacks on Jewish outposts and on Jewish settlers started as early as 1921, and these attacks have never ceased. The wars in 1948 and 1967 were initiated and provoked by the Arab states, not by Israel. It is true, though, that Israel unwisely leveraged its victories, not to make peace, but to oppress the Palestinians and for territorial gains, sometimes in cahoots with much despised colonial powers, such as Britain and France in 1956. Israel is not a perfect state. Israel committed mistakes and errors. It made mistakes. All humans do, individually and collectively. Perhaps the problem is that Israel has not learned from its mistakes. That is also pretty human and pretty common. But don't conflate Israel and the, Jew and the Jewish people. There are many in the Jewish people who disagree with Israel's policies. The anti-Semite shook his head in disagreement. This volatile mixture of ideological racism, messianic empire building, malignant theocracy, much resented by the vast majority of secular Jews, this alignment with all entities anti-Arab and anti-Muslim, this will doom the Jewish country. In the long run, the real inheritors and proprietors of the Middle East are its long-term inhabitants. The Arabs, not you, the Jews, the newcomers. A strong army is not a guarantee of longevity. See the examples of the USSR, the example of Yugoslavia. They had extremely powerful enemies. Nazi Germany has had a powerful enemy army. A powerful army does not guarantee your survival and existence. Jews seem to vacillate between being too weak and then subject to pogroms and, and, and slaughters and being too strong and then narcissistically bullying people. This is, this is psychopathy. Psychopaths are like this. The anti-Semite was really riled up emotionally. <laughs> Even now, he said, it is not too late. Israel can transform itself into an important and benevolent reg regional player by embracing its Arab neighbors and by champion championing the causes of economic and scientific development, integration and opposition to outside interference in the region's internal affairs. The Arabs, exhausted by decades of conflict and backwardness, are likely to heave a collective sigh of relief and embrace Israel. Six Arab countries already have, and Saudi Arabia was next. Maybe they're reluctant. Maybe they're not so happy about it. Maybe it's not a love affair. Maybe it's not as warmly um, as you would have wished. First, you have to prove yourselves. 
Jews and Israelis as a reliable ally and friend. You were enemies. Israel's demographic problem is difficult to resolve, maybe impossible. It requires Israel to renounce its exclusive racist and theocratic nature. Israel must suppress, by force if need be, the lunatic fringe of militant religious fanatics that has been haunting its politics in the last four decades, five decades. And it must extend a welcoming hand to its Arab citizens by legislating and enforcing a set of civil rights laws. Maybe you should have a constitution, I don't know. I said, look, whether this Jewish state is doomed or not, time will tell. Peace with our Arab neighbors and equal treatment of our Arab citizens should be our two overriding strategic priorities. The Jewish state cannot continue to live by the sword. If you live by the sword, you perish by the sword. If the will is there, all this can be done. And we've seen hesitant steps in this direction. The alternative is too horrible to contemplate. But what do you do? For example, after a terrorist attack, such as Hamas's attack on October 7th, everything is embedded in context. Of course, Hamas's attack, as the Secretary of the United Nations has said, of course it didn't come out of thin air, but it's still a terrorist attack against unarmed civilians butchery and savagery seen only in the Middle Ages with the Mongolian hordes. How do you then proceed? Do you suggest, for example, that Israel should not react militarily in any way, shape or form? Do you suggest that it just turns the other cheek and overlooks this? Do you suggest that it goes on pretending that the Hamas who has won elections in 2006 and who has gained 53% of popularity as recently as 2021, should Israel pretend that the Hamas does not represent the Palestinians? 80% of people in Lebanon support the Hamas and over, over half of them want Lebanon to re-enter the war against Israel. <laughs> Regardless of the utter devastation and destruction that the previous wars have brought upon, Leban upon Lebanese heads. Arabs want Israel destroyed, exterminated, eradicated, and removed. Period. Now, some Arab states, and many, many Arabs, are willing to, de to defer, to postpone this goal, and to engage in peace gestures, economic collaboration, intelligence sharing, and good neighborly relations. And maybe, in due time, they will forget the dream of pushing all Israelis to the sea and returning all of them to their places of origin. Maybe. But can Israel bet on this? Can it base its survival strategy on Arab change of heart and benevolence? No, it can't. Of course it can't. On the other hand, Israel's insistence on occupying territories flush with millions of Arabs is a seriously stupid and bad idea. Self-defeating and self-destructive, I've ever seen one. There is no unanimity among Jews, and that is why I reject anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism uses any argument against Israel, against Zionism, against specific Jews. Anti-Semitism would use and leverage anything that smacks of Jew hatred and rejection of the Jews, and then conflate and confuse and, and you know, when Jews, when a Jew commit crimes, all Jews are blamed. When a state that happens to be Jewish commits transgressions, breaks international law, all Jews are blamed. Why? Why is that? Because Jew hatred is not dependent on rationality and fact-finding and fact-checking. It's counterfactual. It's a conspiracy theory. And so we 
we need to we need to get to grips with the fact that there is no way to eliminate the Jewish people or the Jewish question. We'll be here forever. Various solutions have been tried. Hitler had one solution. Herzl had another solution. The Jewish state is just one experiment in trying to solve the Jewish question. Hitler's solution failed. The Jewish state might, might well fail. But coexistence with the Jews is inevitable. Get used to it. Get over it. <laughs> Grow up. Learn to accept reality rather than reject it in favor of some fantastic conspiracy or some idiotic set of un ahistorical and counterfactual arguments. It's immature. Antisemitism is immature. It's clownish. And at the heart of all this is the Holocaust. And with your kind permission, my anti-Semitic friend, I would like to conclude by revisiting the Holocaust. Perhaps if I present a more balanced and objective view of this event, we could find common ground and you will lose your hatred for the Jews and I will, re I will gain a friend, a new one. Who knows? So listen well. Let's start with the first question. Was the Holocaust a unique event in European or even human history? The Holocaust was a genocide, one of a few genocides that occurred in Europe, Africa, the Americas, and Asia in the 19th and 20th centuries. It was the natural and inevitable culmination of trends in European history through uh, European thoughts and European ideas. Scholars like Goldhagen and Nuremberg, they teach us that Hitler's policies were not an aberration, but a natural extension of developments such as colonialism, imperialism, mercantilism, romanticism, and anti-Judaism. All the elements that comprise the Holocaust as an industrial process of annihilation, concentration camps, all these elements were long in use by other countries, such as the British Empire, and Soviet Russia. Hitler eclectically applied these policies, instruments and institutions in the European hinterland rather than in Africa or Asia or the Americas. And he applied them against the white race rather than against blacks, reds and so-called yellows. Was the Holocaust planned in advance? Was it always a policy of Hitler? And when he came to power, a policy of the Third Reich? Absolutely not, actually. Scholarship shows that the answer is no. Scholars such as Bauer and Hilberg clearly documented that the phase of extermination was an improvised solution to the exigencies of war. The Germans, led by the Nazis, at first planned to evict the Jews from Europe to make it Judenheim and then resettle the Jews elsewhere. Only when they have conquered territories which contained millions of Ostium, the poor, uneducated Jews of Eastern Europe, only then and only when the Allies blocked all Jewish immigration to their countries and territories, only then did Germans reach the decision to annihilate the Jewish population throughout the continent at the Wannsee Conference in January 1942. And how did the Jews outside Europe react to the Holocaust? And this is an excellent argument to show you that the Jewish people is not mon monolithic. Your constant attacks on Jews betray your ignorance, profound ignorance, about what it is to be a Jew, the dynamics inside the Jewish people, and so on and so forth. This is a perfect example. How did the Jews outside Europe react to the Holocaust? Even when the full scale of the Holocaust, even when the existence of death camps such as, such as Auschwitz became fully documented and known, Jews in the United States and, and in Palestine had an ambivalent reaction to the unfolding horrors in Europe. The strategies the Jews have chosen to cope with the unthinkable rendered the Holocaust 
inevitable. American Jews preferred to not rock the boat, to acquiesce with the policies of the Roosevelt administration, which did not regard halting the Holocaust as a war priority. The Jews were afraid of an anti-Semitic response within the United States if they were to press their case. They believed that non-Jews would rebel against turning the conduct of war in Europe into a Jewish affair, intended just to save the Jews. Similarly, the political leadership of the Jews in Palestine, headed by David Ben-Gurion, they preferred to concentrate on the creation of a Jewish homeland, where the remains, the remnants of the devastated Jewish communities in Europe could find refuge after the war. Their hands in Palestine were full. Both the British authorities and the indigenous Arab population were dead set against this vision of a Jewish state. Additionally, the Jewish community in Palestine, the Yishuv, they were divided among violent extremists, today we would call them terrorists, and moderates. One group, for example, the Stern Gang, group of Jews, even supported the Nazis. They offered the Nazis collaboration against the British. Was the State of Israel given to the Jews as compensation for the Holocaust? To some extent, yes. People felt guilty. People all over the world, definitely in Europe, felt guilty about not lifting a finger to help the Jews as they were being slaughtered by the millions. So these guilty people, and guilty they were, voted for a Jewish state in the United Nations in 1947. But the British officially recommended establishing a Jewish state as early as 1937, long before the Holocaust. Jews and Arabs in Palestine were entangled in a bloodied conflict since 1882. It seemed that there was no way out except two states for two nations. Ironically, this is now the position of the international community, for example, the United States, and has been the position of the vast majority of governments of Israel, excepting the present one. So here's the context. And this is why it's wrong to generalize, to castigate and label all the Jews, to tar them all with a single brush. And of course, it's always wrong to not rely on facts when you're making arguments. Try that next time, my anti-Semitic friend.